Welcome back to the Market Madness Podcast. I am your host, Gob Blacksburg. I'm here today with one of my favorite guys on Twitter, Runaway Investor. Runaway Investor became my favorite because this guy's transparent. He responds fast. He responds to basically all your posts. He loves some of my favorite stocks. Welcome to the pod, Runaway Investor. Uh, hey there, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Wolf for having me on here. Uh, I think what he's doing is really great. He's creating this environment and he's providing a lot of new information about stocks. So um, I guess, what what are we looking at here? What's my yeah. favorite ticker? So yep. let's get into it. Obviously, we're here talking about Market Madness today. If people don't know about Market Madness yet, they will tomorrow when it launches live at 12 p.m. Eastern noon. It is a giant tournament of stocks going head to head in a popularity contest. What is your favorite stock in Market Madness, your champion that you think can win it all? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, before I even go ahead and say it, I think a lot of people are going to know what I'm going to say here, and it's going to be Palantir Technologies. And I, I've i been, a lot of people who, who have been following me on Twitter know I've been talking Palantir, Palantir. I've started talking Palantir since October. I think Palantir is a really good company. It's, it's really unique. It's, it's a company that specializes in big data. It's headquartered in Denver, Colorado, and it's founded by like one of the PayPal Dawn, Peter Thiel in 2003. Very cool. So let's break down the two aspects here because we like to talk fundamentals and we like to talk sentimentals. So talk to me about the fundamentals and the DNA of Palantir that attract you to Palantir as an investment. Uh, so what attracts me to Palantir? So Palantir, it's, it's a very interesting company. It's, it's unique. So when I say it's unique, Palantir is a stock that really got started back in 2003 and it started as a response to the uh, rise of global terrorism not many people do what palantir does actually uh they work in the uh so the thing is they work in the government both commercial and government sector and there's not really much competition in what they do their their defense sector is growing it's very strong and as i said they're like really heavily invested in the united states government they're big data for the FBI and CIA. I think Palantir, actually one of the one of the biggest uh, funders of Palantir back in 2002 was the CIA. And 40% of their revenue, they had a 40% revenue increase from 2019 uh, to 2000 and uh, to 2020 of $1.1 billion. And I think the thing that really got me here was even though Palantir, the, their government contracts grew by 70%, it still represents 50% of their business. But the thing that really caught my eyes, and it's, it's, it's one of the things that's going forward, is Palantir's introduction into the commercial unit. So between last year and this year, Palantir saw a 107% increase year over year for commercial contracts and revenues. So this sounds great, but this is still not representing a lot of Palantir's business. Like I mentioned, just 50% of the business or 70% of the contracts were for uh, government contracts and 50% of the business is still focused on government projects. And I feel like that's still very early in the company. It's to the point where the world is changing a lot. Big data is a growing field, right? So we have big companies like Facebook, Amazon. We saw Amazon recently just do, um, just do a contract with Palantir. That was very interesting. You see the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world come to Palantir and you know, a lot of people, what do they know about Palantir? You know, Palantir is a small company. Why would Amazon be so interested in coming with Palantir and working with Palantir? We saw, we saw Airbus. Airbus has, um, they got Palantir to build them a, a special software. It's called the Skyway software. Mm -hmm. And that software basically takes, Airbus is, if, if, uh, if you guys don't know what Airbus is, I think a lot of people know what Airbus here. It's, it's just a competitor to Boeing. They make planes, they have, a lot of planes they make for people. But essentially Airbus went to Palantir and they're like, look, we have sensors in our planes. We have millions of sensors. We need help understanding what this data means. We need to understand when can we solve, prevent, even build on an existing problem. How do we, how do we work with our data? What do we do? We have too much data. We just can't handle it. We need help making sense of it. Palantir is, it's, it's a growing business, especially in this, in this new age, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing oil, what oil used to be, we're just seeing data as being the new oil. It's, it's just something that's going to keep growing and growing. And 
that's that's really what attracts me to Palantir. It has one of the strongest management in the world. Alex Karp and Peter Thiel, they're working very strong in the company. Some of the biggest, most powerful businesses are coming, building commercial contracts with them. That's what really interests me into the, uh, in the company right now. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I definitely think they've got a dream team management. I like what you're saying about the direction the company's going in. We've seen the validation of them where big companies have come in and said, okay, we want to be involved with you. We want to be in partnerships with you. So let's talk real quick just about your short-term and your long-term outlook for PLTR. Yeah, so um, my short-term outlook for Palantir is, this is a very interesting one, right? So Palantir, we, <laughs> it's really associated with, I hate to say it, but it's really associated with the Wall Street Bets uh, Forum. So I was I, like I was in Palantir before it really got onto this whole Reddit thing, but it's I mean it's great right it obviously gets the social sentiment going and everything but I think in this short time Palantir really becomes um, it becomes a stock where the fundamentals aren't exactly matching up with the price and it's what people are willing to pay for the what people are actually willing to pay for the stock itself. So in the short time, we can see Palantir rise up a lot, but it's not the short term that I'm really going for here. Obviously as a trader, it probably is a lot of fun to trade Palantir. I'm sure a lot of people caught it from 20 to 40 and however they wanted to play it. But in the long term, I think Palantir will do great. In the short term, it will also do great. But if you're trading on margin, if, if you have over, if you're over leveraged, I think you're putting yourself in a really dangerous situation here because we have seen the stock to be very volatile. And I don't think this volatility is going to ease down anytime soon. But I still think overall in the short term, I'd probably estimate a price target back to anywhere from 35 to $40. But in the long term, there's really no, it's hard to pin a price on this, right? We saw companies like Tesla, right? <laughs> Who knew Tesla was going to do what it did, right? I had a buddy who was invested in Tesla. He was up 200%, right? I told him, you know, you've made your money. It's time to sell. Stock goes up another 400% in front of his face, right? So it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen in the short term. Yeah, very difficult, especially in this type of environment to ever predict, which is why it's so good to have ones that you're comfortable in long term where you understand the fundamentals. So my final questions on the fundamentals are you're pretty transparent. Um, are you okay telling everyone kind of ballparking how much Palantir is? Is it the number one investment in your portfolio right now and kind of how much you have in it? Okay, so I, I actually do happen to own 20 plus stocks. I am involved in cryptocurrencies a lot. I only own one stock on the US market and that happens to be Palantir. I own 20 plus stocks on the Toronto Stock Exchange, which not many people probably do trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange here on Twitter. Palantir is my biggest investment actually. I own currently 5,800 shares of it. I think that the investment, it's, it's probably one of my only um, gross, yeah, actually it is probably one of my only gross stocks that I own. I think that um, as the best investment, Palantir isn't actually one of the most uh, fundamentally best investments in the market. And the reason I say this is because of this. First of all, uh, it's, it, it's PE ratio isn't too good here, but I, I also argue that it's uh, gross profit margin is very strong. It's uh, number of shares outstanding is strong, but it's, it's free cash flow is not too good. It is a growth stock, right? So we're also looking to the point where how important are fundamentals here if you're considering growth. But one of the things that really stands out to me here is its current assets is greater than its liabilities. So it doesn't raise a big issue with any debts if any depths were to arise here, it probably would, wouldn't be too much of an issue. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of biggest investment, yeah, Palantir does happen to be my biggest investment uh, in the stock market. My next biggest investment would be in the crypto market. RSR? Uh, no, it actually not anymore, but I hope, uh, I hope the Rangers aren't watching this because I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But uh, I, I see that I kept the, I, I actually did decrease my position for RSR a bit because they, uh, they released some supply. And I just, after what I saw with the pound tier lockup period, I, I've gone in PTSD. <laughs> so uh, I, I transitioned to Cosmos, Adam. I think Cosmos uh, is a really good project right now. I think it's a pretty fair price. It's, uh, would you like to hear more information about what I think about Cosmos or just? Yeah, give me the, give me the 30 seconds on it. 
Yeah, so Cosmos is basically, it's trying to create an interoperable platform. It's, it's trying to connect the blockchain together. So the, the way I see Cosmos is it's really Cosmos versus Polkadot. So Cosmos currently sits at like $18, whereas Polkadot's like roughly $40. But the supply is one fifth of the Polkadot supply. And its market cap is, I believe it's like eight times smaller. So I, if you compare Cosmos and you compare Polkadot, I think right now, if you were to buy any cryptocurrency, I think that you anybody who's buying right now should probably buy some Cosmo. Just it's, you know, it's never it's never going to hurt to keep a bag. And, and can people buy Cosmo from the U.S. right now? Actually, yeah. See, Cosmo is available on Coinbase. Okay. Your RSR RSR is very hard to get if you're looking to get right, RSR yes. in America. Yeah, it's, me, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. Okay. Interesting. I like to take on the fundamentals. It sounds like we're going to have to do another pod, another time where we talk crypto because I love how into that world you are. So we're definitely going to do that. But because of the time crunch now, let's talk about social sentiment. So as we both know, this is a popularity contest essentially when it comes down to it, because it's all voting on Twitter. So tell me, why do you believe that PLTR can win a social sentiment popularity contest? Who else is going to be pushing it? How have people been talking about it? Tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good one, actually. Yeah, so what we've seen on Reddit and stuff, and especially all over Twitter, we have, I think, Palantir is on Reddit, the number three most talked about stock just uh, behind AMC. And obviously, we know GameStop is number one. But I think as long as, uh, I, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Alex Kirk, just, just if you take a look at the guy's hair, right? As long as he just keeps his hair and doesn't get a haircut, we're going to be in a good position. <laughs> and the reason I say this is I, I might be joking. I might not be joking. But what you need for it in order to keep a conversation going is you need you need a stock that can also be memed. <laughs> like, as crazy as it is, look at Elon Musk, for example, right? Elon Musk is all over the place. He likes to talk. I mean, it creates this volatility. But... At the same time, it's like when you get management like Alex Karp, he's just a really open guy and really smart guy. And he, he's all over the place. Like you could never guess who Alex Karp is. He's, he's like this guy who's really smart. And then he, like he, he's just like, he's a meme in one corner. It's just amazing. Like I, th I think that the conversation is just going to keep going, especially on Reddit. The guys on Reddit, they just absolutely love this stock. It's just growing and growing popularity on twitter you see all these big guys on twitter who who like to talk about it but you do you do also catch guys like uh kremer kremer is not a big fan of it especially when kathy's buying kremer is like oh why are you buying at these prices whatever but kremer kremer tends to say a lot of stuff and i'm not gonna like he got tesla wrong and like when i mean he got it wrong he got it wrong big time so that great point with kremer for sure um now, when it comes down to it, I also believe that PLTR, I think it does have that social media backing. You pointed out it's the number three trending stock on Reddit. Now, let's talk specific matchups. PLTR, first round matchup against Zoom. Interesting, because we're on Zoom right now. Talk to me about that matchup and how PLTR and Zoom stack up from a social sentiment perspective. Uh, so actually, I, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Zoom recently. You know, like when I'm thinking about it, I remember back in November uh, when we saw all this uh, schooling and all the work were going online. I think a lot of the people they were using Zoom, but it seems like the, the hype has died down about Zoom. I haven't heard too much on Twitter about Zoom, and honestly, like we, Zoom, Zoom actually that's pretty interesting because we we still are using Zoom's products, right? But we just don't talk about it that much anymore. It's almost become like a necessity in our lives, right? We just hop on Zoom, we have conversations. So I guess the it's a verb. Social, yeah, it's a verb. Yeah, the social sentiment is it's slowing down, but more and more people are using it. So we can see this inverse relationship going on. So let's take it to the next level. Doesn't sound like you're too scared of Zoom. However, PLTR, if it wins that first matchup, it has a very likely date with Tesla in the second round. Because Tesla is going against Etsy and PLTR is going against Zoom. And then whoever wins those goes against each other. So how do, tell me how you're feeling about that second round. Uh, that second round is going to be pretty interesting, but what I've seen on Twitter is, especially what's going on, you have these all-in Tesla guys. Um, a couple guys that could, there's this one guy, what's, uh, I think I, I forgot his name, what was it? He, he's really a big Tesla guy. He happens to own the newsletter for Tesla. Are you familiar with him? 
Which guy? Uh, he's that. Uh, he's uh, he, he's um. I think he's located in Asia. He happens to have that uh, Tesla newsletter he promotes. Not a hundred percent sure. I'd have to look into it. I, I think maybe the, a lot of people who watch it are probably going to know who he is, but like a lot of big backers on Tesla, they've, they've come out and they've publicly stated we've added positions and talents here. And to me, you get, you get these guys who were just buying Tesla for the last four, three, five years, whatever it's been. And they're like noticing like talent here a great company and usually these guys they like to stay quiet you know tesla's the stock 10-year stock it's going to 10 trillion dollar market cap it's going to do these crazy things so tesla tesla's going to be an interesting one because no matter what people just love this, the company it's not even about the stock yeah oh musk um yeah it, okay. let's yeah. zoom out a little bit going into this bracket so you i don't know if you have the brackets up um you can you can check that out i sent you a link in the dms yeah, I, I do have it open yet. Okay, so let's take a look at this. What strategy are you using to fill out your bracket? Uh, so can you give me more information about that? Yeah, so when you're thinking about this, matchups coming from different sides, right? There's the meme stocks, there's the ETFs. What appeals to you? What are you going to be like, okay, these, these are easy wins. I'm, may, I'm definitely picking these. Um, are, do you, are there certain people maybe you think like a stock like Penn or Buzz could get a retweet from Portnoy, right? So where's your thought pattern when you're just like making your decisions moving through? Yeah, that one's going to be interesting, especially when when you compare Palantir to a lot of these other uh, stocks. So a lot of these stocks, probably some some of them probably do have a lower market cap. So if if like let's say a big influential person were to tweet it out, I could probably see a lot of them going up um, a lot more than Palantir. Palantir sits at 50 billion market cap, so it's not exactly um, you know, you tweet it out and the stock's doing 100%. Like we've seen like Sunbell or whatever, whatever is going on. Zach Morris tweets it out and the stock goes 500%. Yeah. Some crazy, some craziness going on there. So obviously it's going to be tough to deal with here. But uh, majority of stocks here in the, in the bracket, they're pretty much all somewhat to the same level. I think Dogecoin, that's going to be an interesting one moving forward. Yeah. Obviously if Elon, if Elon Musk goes out and says, you know, Tesla's now accepting dogecoin you know i'm gonna be in trouble like i already know i'm gonna be in trouble but it's gonna be interesting moving forward so i guess i have to keep watching the social sentiment what's gonna happen who's who's backing each project definitely now taking a look at the bracket are there any stocks etfs or cryptos that you think are underrated they're gonna make a maybe they're a lower seed and they could win a couple of rounds they can make a break they could get some backing anything that you think is an underdog to watch out for I think BlackBerry is actually a very interesting stock. I know uh, I grew up by the BlackBerry um, where they do all their operations here in Ontario. So, I, you know, I've seen that company rise to fame and I've seen it fall, but the, it looks like the company structure is different. And I was, I was reading a bit about it ago. Like I've seen that their profits are going up a lot more. So it really puts them in a situation where are they able to get back to like, say, the, I don't know if they're ever going to get back to the all-time highs, but that company is one like I'd probably keep watching out for. Uh, what else is on here? Ethereum. Ethereum is a very interesting one. So you're going to have the Ethereum 2.0 launching in the next couple of years. Uh, maybe not in terms of the bracket. I don't know about the short yeah. time, but if Ethereum. Ethereum essentially has a problem right now. Like, I don't. I don't want to say a problem. Like it's it's gas fees are just way too high, right? The miners are making ridiculous amounts of money. And I feel like something needs to be done about this. And this is why they've introduced Ethereum 2.0. They're in the process of, you know, changing the whole network and providing a solution where the, the miners aren't going to be making as much, but it's, it's going to make Ethereum a lot more faster, a lot more stable, and it's going to really change the layout of Ethereum. So Ethereum is one I'd watch out for. Uh, what else is on here for? Yeah, I guess going through them. Oh, is that the Boeing? Yeah, Bo Boeing is going to be a nice one. It's uh, I've been watching Boeing. That one, I actually did have Boeing at 130. That's an interesting one. I think they'd probably do well in the short time. Uh, yeah, that's a, oh QQJ. Yeah, triple QJ. That that one probably will do very well in the next uh, in the long term. It's got some I, nice uh, some nice backing on Twitter too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. So. so to wrap things up, first of all. I love the analysis. I love the breakdown of the fundamentals. Clearly, you know what you're talking about with PLTR and several of these other stocks and cryptos. Is there anything that you would like to say to your audience, say to our audience, um, before we wrap up the live? Um, yeah, so I think 
Palantir, a lot, like a lot of people mentioned it. It's, it's Palantir has a couple of things it's going on for. It's arguably one of the most important software companies in the world. We've heard this a couple of times, but what does it really mean, right? Yeah. So when it, com- when it comes down with data, it's to the point where people are, are willing to pay whatever amount it is in order to unlock their data, right? So you've got this whole opportunity cost, right? You mm-hmm. have a lot of information about your clients, about what you're trying to seek out for, right? But it becomes to the point where it's how much are you willing to pay? And this becomes interesting, right? So it's, it's, it's really interesting in the sense that it's, it might not be the fundamentally best stock, but if companies want to be, want to have the lead, they want to be in front of their competitors, they need to unlock their data. They need to understand what's going on in the market. But moving forward, I think Palantir, it's, I think it has a tiny issue. And the issue is like, if you're buying Palantir right now, it comes to, the issue isn't in buying, it becomes the selling because it's a lot harder to understand now when to exit because the fundamentals are just not there. I'd argue buying Palantir at these prices would become the easy part. But if we see the stock go exponential, you're going to find it really hard to sell. No matter what you do, like I've heard this a hundred times, probably in the last couple months, like this is the only time in the market where you feel like an idiot when you sell at a hundred percent gain, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it's true though, because the, the issue isn't in buying. Obviously, like if, for example, if I bought a stock and I lost a hundred percent, I'd be pretty upset, right? But yeah. if I sold at a hundred percent and that stock went to a thousand percent, I'd be devastated. Like, I wish I would have, I mean, I don't wish I would have lost hundred percent, but it's hard. You know what I mean? Like, obviously selling at hundred percent and then stock goes 10 X, right? So this is the point where you need to know what to do here, right? So you need to have a strategy. I myself have a strategy. I have exit point one, two, three, you know, like I don't, yep. if I play, if I play my cards right, you know, like a lot of people, they could see it as, oh, you know, like I could hold on to this for the rest of my life, which I don't know, might work out, might not work out, but you know, do you want to be successful trading or are you a full-time gambler? So that's the hard part, right? And so we see the fundamentals start aligning more with the stock itself. And we would actually try to pinpoint a price. We'd know what's going on, when to sell it, right? But Pantheon is a growth stock. We could see this 10x, we could see it do crazy numbers, but at the same time, you're never going to be able to pinpoint where to sell. Fascinating perspective in a very, very volatile market. Love yeah. um, talking PLTR with you. Like I said, we definitely have to do another one. I'm going to bring you back on. We're going to talk all the cryptos that are in this bracket, hopefully, because I feel like that's a move. Um, thank you to everyone that watched. We're going to throw this up on YouTube. We're going to do some editing on the clip. At this point, I'm going to close off the recording.